a, a challenge that is coming from digital currencies such as blockchain technologies. So I think it's important to share that anything can be tokenized. All the money. I like the idea of a gold standard. I mean, it could be used in a very um, cryptocurrency way. Very much sooner than a lot of people understand it. Think we will be all at a level playing field. Hey, welcome to the show. Molly here. Today we have a special guest on Escape Velocity. Jimmy is out of town and Courtney Brown has decided to join me to talk about the exciting world of real estate and specifically tokenized real estate. So welcome, Courtney. It's so nice to see you again. Thank you. I'm excited to be a part of this. I was fortunate to meet Courtney at an event we had in Austin a couple weeks ago. So I'm really excited to have her on the show today. I'm excited to be on. Cool. All right, before we get into kind of the meat of what we're going to talk about, can you please give me a story? What's your story? What's your background? How'd you get into real estate? And why is tokenized yeah. real estate even interesting? Yeah, um, I have always been passionate about real estate. Something about the sky is the limit with this industry. Um, you can take it as far as you want. There's no barriers. And I was licensed at 20 years old, started selling real estate. Um, did a few different asset classes. So I dabbled in lending. I did residential sales. I went over to REOs when the market tanked in 2008. Um, we were responsible, the company that I worked for, we were responsible for taking all of Wachovia's product at the time and placing it okay. on the market as REOs. So doing things such as broker price opinions, going and checking on um, vacancies in homes, things very that I probably would not do at this time. Now I'm a little bit older and smarter. Uh, and then also going into, into the development world, doing hospitality, hotel development, commercial mm -hmm. development. Um, I've been involved in a few large scale resort properties. So kind of a diverse mix. I found myself at Roofstock just being slightly burnt out in sales, to be totally honest with you. It was something okay. where I wanted to try something different. I saw tech as an emerging field. Um, I came across Roofstock. I didn't know much about it. I interviewed, I got the job, I dove into tech space head on. I really enjoyed the culture fit. Um, I'm the type of person where I like to go a million miles a minute and tech suits that for me. So it was a good fit for me and it also gave me access to different market insights and just things that I would never have as a sole person sitting in California or wherever it was. Um, I just wouldn't have access to that and I loved that and I had the opportunity to join the Web3 division here about eight months ago. Um, so I went down the Web3 rabbit hole and I'm probably stuck here for life. <laughs> Tell us please what Roofstock, Roofstock does for those not familiar. Yeah, so Roofstock is a prop tech company. We've been around for six years. The initial thought of Roofstock uh, and the intention was to make real estate investing available to everyone. Okay. So being a West Coast investor wanting something in, let's say, Indianapolis or Atlanta, you found challenges. You didn't have boots on the ground agents to help you out. Um, if you did, it was a very hard process to find someone that you truly trusted that was remote. You didn't have the resources to get an accurate inspection um, without having biased opinions. It was hard placing a tenant, finding property management was also difficult. So what Roofstock did was kind of gave a full stack approach to, I'm an investor, I'm looking in this prop or in this market, I'm gonna put you in front of an agent who has local expertise, a property management who we've already vetted and we know is a solid property management company. We hold them to certain KPIs that they have to meet in order to be on our preferred list. Uh, we reviewed the inspection reports to give you really granular details on rehab work if that was needed. So it really was a comfortable way that people in a remote setting could invest in homes in different states or wherever they were. Okay, and then what does the Web3 element bring to the table? Yeah, so uh, the Web3, I'm most excited, I'm biased about this, but real estate has not seen 
a ton of innovation. So tech is one of those innovations that the industry has seen, but in terms of how we transact, it's always been a very web to process. Uh, you go into contract, you have several agents, title company, escrow company. Um, we wanted to change that and we saw blockchain technology as an opportunity to do so. So what the Web3 um, has come up with is essentially a way to place the homes on the blockchain and transact with one click versus going into contract having intermediaries left and right, um, having paper trails of things, DocuSigns, weeks of in contract. You literally purchase a home with one click through your digital wallet and the ownership gets transferred to you via blockchain and it's a simple process. So would you describe this as the tokenization of real estate? Yes, well, that's, it has to, the real estate has to be tokenized to settle on the blockchain. And what does that mean for people not familiar with that sort of concept of tokenized real estate? So I would almost put it as to compare it to something in very layman's terms with people who are not familiar with the blockchain. Um, you have a county recorder's office and a county recorder's office, office uses the assessor's parcel number, which is the APN. That's the unique identifier to the home. And it records all of the histories and the title changes on that home. So essentially, when you tokenize a home, you are creating a digital unique identifier, which is just like that APN, but that unique digital identifier is what enables the home to transact on the blockchain and for the title ownership to transfer on the blockchain. So it's taking something that, that really already exists, but in the mm -hmm. Web3 version, tokenizing it and creating an, a unique identifier for it to transact on the blockchain. Got it. Because I think when people first hear this idea, it seems crazy, like how is a house going to be like on the blockchain? But That's it's really- like, Yeah, it's, it's really, it's hard. When I first did this too, it's almost like when you're coming from Web2 real estate, which is super traditional, no innovation, very arduous process all around, you almost have to unlearn what you've learned because it's so ingrained in you. And when you've been doing it for so long, it's like, this is not, you get stuck in your old ways almost. Um, so that's why I compare it to, I mean, a title company is like a perfect use case for a blockchain, just a digital version. And does this process of tokenizing real estate involve NFTs? It does, correct. Yeah. So uh, process of tokenizing the home, the home gets placed into a Wyoming single purpose LLC. Reason okay. for it being Wyoming is Wyoming is a very crypto friendly state um, and it allows for the tokenization of the LLC. The home also gets registered in the state which it resides, but for all purpose of tokenizations, home gets purchased, put into the Wyoming LLC. Um, the LLC is what's wrapped in the NFT. So when the NFT transfers, the, the membership interest in the LLC is what transfers and that gives the home ownership to the new purchaser. And then how do people pay? Like, do they have to use a digital asset to do Great this? Great question. Great question. So it is done via crypto. However, we do have partners where um, we can on-ramp, off-ramp, however we need to. If you have, we've done a sale where it was completely crypto. Um, we've also done some where we had buyers transfer us fiat and then we sent back USDC to them. Um, yeah. To be honest, that's probably the hardest process of the Web3 home is if you're converting fiat to crypto, um, but there's ways around it. Has the banking industry been helpful with you guys? No, I, we just had a call this week, earlier this week, and surprisingly enough, we are hearing talks about big banks recognizing crypto as currency and the fact that some people have been utilizing down payments, large substantial down payments in crypto. So we spoke to a company this week where 
it's now a thing, which is amazing in the Web3 community, where you can take crypto, a large chunk of crypto, and convert it into fiat, and it's an instantaneous settlement versus an ACH that could take days, weeks, however long. That's amazing. It is amazing. So have you seen, like, what have people been telling you after going through this process about sort of transacting on the blockchain? Yeah, um, everyone loves it. It's it's a very innovative process for a buyer. The last buyer that we had, we got on Zoom and he went from clicking, wanting to buy the home to owning the home within 30 minutes. And the only thing that, that made it, to be honest with you, 30 minutes is the KYC process. We do KYC our, our buyers just for ways of doing it compliantly. And since we were on Zoom, the KYC took longer because it was like cameras involved. But in a in a normal uh, setting, it probably would have taken about 15 times or 15 minutes for him to have ownership of the home. The other, um, when you talk about big banks as well, the other very interesting, amazing thing about these homes is we have access to DeFi lending since they are digital assets. So okay. this particular buyer was able to obtain a 65% loan to value um, loan within, call it five minutes from requesting it to having funds delivered to their wallet. That was gonna be my next question. Are the lenders eager to participate in sort of this innovative new investment channel? Yeah, so we are partnered right now with a lender teller and they are an NFT lender. Okay. They look at this as an NFT, same as let's call it like a board ape or a crypto punk. And so they, they see it as um, it's over collateralized, so you have to put a substantial down payment. It's not like 100% financing, but they see it as nothing different. So there's no um, credit underwriting. There's no appraisals that need to be done. The value lies within the asset, which is the NFT wrapped in this tangible asset being real estate. So it's very, very different from what traditional finance has seen. I think that lenders will start to come around. I mean, even at the Austin event, there were a ton of hard money lenders and even traditional lenders where I noticed they were at the conference trying to see where they could come into play. So it's an interesting mm -hmm. time. Um, we haven't, I haven't seen any big lenders wanting to be in this space just yet, but I think it's coming. Interesting. So this the, this has the potential to completely change real estate. I wholeheartedly believe, so I have young kids, I wholeheartedly believe that this will be the way that they transact in the future of buying real estate. And what will that mean for someone like in a day to day or like set of steps basis. Like what would that change for me if I tomorrow wanted to decide, you know, invest in a real estate venture? Yeah, so it's it's first of all a stra it all relies on your strategy. So what is your real estate strategy that you have? We deal with single family rentals right now just due okay. to security laws and being in a very highly regulated industry. So if I were speaking to you and you wanted to become a real estate investor, um, this is a great way for you to transact with minimal friction being, again, you're not having a ton of DocuSign packets come in through your email. You're not reviewing a litany of documents. You purchase a home with one click, but you also have access to this DeFi lending, which is, it's, it's twofold. So the innovation and the ease of purchasing a home. And then traditionally speaking, home, home loans on investment properties are extremely hard to get. Um, it's considered an investment, so they kind of like fine tooth comb every single mm -hmm. bank report that you have. Um, the DeFi portion of this eliminates that, and you don't necessarily have to go through the very uh, <laughs> hard and arduous process mm -hmm. of obtaining an investment loan. 
I know this isn't what Roofstock does, but I'm just curious of your knowledge of this. If if someone were to build a new home and they needed money like before the home exists, like how does that work with the blockchain if there isn't this ID number in the initial stage? Yeah, there's there's some companies out there. We personally don't do it at Roofstock, you're correct. There are companies out there where they will almost tokenize the development itself, like the, okay. the idea of the development, and they have their own set of returns, um, whatever the legal structure is, but they will tokenize the development itself and sell those on the blockchain um, to potential investors. Interesting. Now, I know in the U.S. we have a frustrating situation with regulation and securities laws which um, is that kind of holding back Roofstock, you think, from stuff that you guys would like to do? Yeah, um, so I wouldn't say necessarily holding back just in favor of Roofstock. It's almost, so we're a part of a Web2 umbrella. We are a very small division within a very large company. We're the leader in single family residential real estate. Mm -hmm. um, so, Fractionals is a huge thing right now. It's a buzzword within the industry, and we don't necessarily want to dive headfirst into fractionals just due to the securities and the SEC regulations and news coming out every, gosh, other day, if not daily, on uh, regulatory affairs that are being affected by it. Can you explain to us what fractionalized real estate is? Yes. So fractional real estate is instead of owning all of the home, it's fractioned into pieces. So you can own 1 15th, whatever the, some people have it like 1 50th of a home, um, it's fractions of the home and you get dispersed the yield at that fraction. So instead of owning the home itself, you own a portion of it along with other fraction holders. Guys, it's like owning shares of a company, but it's shares of a house. Exactly, it's shares in a home, exactly. And you might not know this because I know you guys don't cover it, but is there any logic to how many shares are issued for a fractionalized real estate project? You know, I have no idea about that. I've mm -hmm. seen it where um, we work with a company in France and they do, gosh, almost like however many people will buy, they fractionalize into it. And then there's other that others that limit it to 50 per home. So I think it's whatever their legal structure is and based on securities. Now, I'm just kind of curious of your personal opinion on this. If you think about how many real estate properties exist, let's just even say in the US, but this would apply to the world. How much work is it gonna to take to move all of them to the blockchain like how is it how is that going to work do you have any idea yeah it's a great question um personally like me courtney brown answering the question it's gonna it's a huge lift we're essentially eliminating a lot of people's positions in an industry so that's going to be a huge friction point um but it's almost like you look at these companies like Uber, where when Uber first came out and they were a huge threat to taxis, and mm -hmm. now the uh, ease of availability on someone's mobile phone, and now Uber's the leader, it's almost something to compare it like that, where we know it exists, we know that the concept has been proven and it works, and now it's just people adapting to the change, and the technology's there, it's only gonna keep evolving and becoming better so i don't think it's something that is going to happen overnight by any means um, i think it's going to take years decades um, a very 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 long time for something like this to happen but when you look at the use case of adding real estate to the blockchain it makes complete sense in terms of a title record um, county records, just anything, ownership transfer, it's all basically a ledger. And when it's digital, why wouldn't someone want that transparency? So would you expect that every, like let's say adoption starts and this, all the regulations are taken care of, would every time a property gets sold, would that be the opportunity to move it onto the blockchain versus yes. just going to a town and saying, let's take all 10,000 things? 
Yeah, I think that you can, there, there's different ways. So if someone wants to buy a Web3 home, you can start there. If someone owns a home and they want to platform the home as a Web3 home, I have also heard of, there's, there's one community in Colorado where they want to put every single home on the blockchain just for provenance reasons, which okay. is great. Um, but it's almost, it, it depends on, it's hard in the US because we were almost at the forefront and now we took a step back to like Singapore and Dubai where they have all of these crazy, they're at the forefront right now of Web3 technology and we've taken a huge backseat. You go into places like Alabama and they're vehemently opposed to anything Web3 blockchain technology. So when you speak about it in terms of America and the US, um, it, it's, it's not as blanket statement across the states that it's going to be easier here or easier there. And what is the resistance from states like Alabama? You know, honestly, I think it's just uh, something that people think is crazy. I mean, it, for lack of better words, you speak to some of these people, the second you mention crypto, blockchain, Web3, they mm -hmm. think that you're crazy and they, they kind of glaze over and check out. Got it. So there's going to be some education required. Education, adaptation, yes. Interesting. Now, you you have experience in the commercial sector. I know Roofstock is focused on residential, but how do you see this impacting the commercial real estate industry in the long term? Yeah, so commercial is just like the single family rentals. They're kind of they're they're considered same not same asset class, but almost as it's a non-owner occupied, so it's not subject to all the consumer laws that an owner occupied home would have. Same thing, you, you platform the home, put it on the blockchain. I can't speak to the exact legal structure of commercial since there's, there's many different variables on them, um, but there's ways to platform a home, to put it on the blockchain and have it as a Web3 home or a tokenized home. Now, I know I'd like to talk about some of the challenges because this is such a cool thing that I know impatient people like me are like, why isn't this already happening everywhere? So you yeah. mentioned that we have some education challenges and some government stuff. What are some of the other challenges you see that are kind of slowing down mass adoption? Yeah, um, I would say so we our first sale was last year in October and it was a ton of buzz around it. Um, mm -hmm. It's almost I would say mainly education of how the process works for it to attract mass adoption. And then we're also in this really uh, kind of crazy environment in both the Web3 crypto side and then also real estate. So we kind of are getting both blows at the same time where if the real estate was on fire like it was in 2021, we probably mm -hmm. would have more sales coming through. But it's almost one of those we're getting we're getting hit from different angles over here with crypto being as volatile as it, as it is and then also real estate being as volatile as it is. Um, we also are trying to bridge a huge gap between traditional being real estate um, and crypto where I'm sure you see this, you go to these crypto um, conferences and people are more interested in investing 100K on a crypto punk or a board ape or whatever it is versus a tangible piece of real estate because that's the world that they're in. So we have to bridge that gap and make them more comfortable with the more traditional way of investing. Now you mentioned that you, uh, a company in France, are, do you guys work with sort of residential investors outside the US? So we partnered with Realty. Um, they use us to source their acquisitions and then they actually do fractionals in France. Okay. We have not had any foreign buyers yet. We, we okay. intend to and we plan on having foreign buyers, um, but it just hasn't happened yet. So can you speak a little bit to what's going on with this tokenized real estate outside the US? You mentioned Singapore and Dubai. Are yeah. they just further ahead? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So um, further ahead, more accepting of it. Uh, it's, it's almost like everyone is, and I can, same for us right now at Roofstock being part of a Web2 
company. It's, it's the apprehension to do something that deals with securities is almost like let's crawl, walk, run versus dive into the security worlds and then have the SEC knocking at our door. So would you expect Europe to also be ahead? Because there's some new regulations, the MICA laws that are going through. I mean, honestly, it's it's so hard to keep up with all of the, okay. um, <laughs> you almost need a chart of where, where these countries are in terms of Web3 adoption and acceptability. Um, Dubai and Singapore right now are like at the top tier. United States has fallen, I think, not to the bottom, but in terms of like where we would rank on the on the top countries. Um, France, they are accepting of the fractionals and they have their own, they've already like planned out their own regulatory issues and non-issues on the securities piece. Um, America is just still trying to figure it out. And that's why it's hard to like create a, a protocol and a platform on this when we just don't know what it's going to look like in the next six months. So is the expectation that the fractional investing might be reserved for accredited investors only? No, I think it's more so um, you have to have a securities dealer broker for these okay instructionals so we have we live in a very very compliant world over here and what we found to be the most compliant is single family rentals they're non-owner occupied um that's like a safe 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 bet for us fractionals you get into um they're treated as a security or they're seen as a security and then you have to go through an entire different legal analysis on how you structure those. Um, we just haven't gotten there yet. I personally would like to get there at some point in time, um, but we're still going through the course of proving out single family rental real estate. Got it. So let's say I bought a house on the blockchain, I'm an NFT. Do I need anyone's permission to go to an exchange to sell it to someone else? Because so you do have to KYC your buyer. Um, okay. So so it all so when you come to the Roofstock website, you mint a soulbound token. Okay. So once you mint the soulbound token, you get KYC through a third party uh, vendor called Jumio, and that enables the soulbound token to kind of activate in the sense that. You have KYC'd yourself as a buyer um, in terms of, again, compliance. So if you wanted to go and sell your home on, let's say, OpenSea, that buyer would have to be KYC'd as well, just due to like terrorism, money laundering, whatever that is. One of the ways that I look at tokenization, is, is including real estate, is that the various property rights associated with owning a house are really what's tokenized. So I'd have the right to sell the house, I have the right to you know, remodel it, I have the right to have parties there, like whatever the rights are associated with ownership. So what happens if like I have this NFT for this house and like the house burns down, but I don't tell anyone, like how, how do you rectify the physical assets with this NFT in event of something strange happening? the home is still a, it still is a real asset so you still have to have insurance on the home okay. all of the things that you would with a normal home um okay. in terms of it burning down i i would hope you would say something to someone including your insurance provider so that that way you can have that rectified but um you have full ownership to the home you can rent it out you can live in it that's the purpose of the LLC and the single member LLC transferring. So the home will stay, once the home is platformed as a Web3 home, it will stay with that LLC. And then the Got membership it. interest is what transfers to owners. Got it. And is that a regulatory issue, this LLC? Like, do you expect that to be the case forever that if I wanna buy an investment property, I have to do this company thing? 
So it's it's what our lawyers spent a year proving out as the most safe, compliant way to do so. Uh, we have heard of other companies doing them in a trust. It's okay. almost like what your attorneys have vetted for you to be the most safe, compliant way. We found it as the LLC, um, and that's what works for us. Now, is this because they're investment property? So if I were to buy a house for myself to live in, I wouldn't need this LLC, right? Well, yes, correct. So you would need the you would need some form of ownership to be tokenized to platform the home. Okay. Um, and that all like in California, when things transfer, they're subject to the real estate transfer tax. And so in California, it doesn't work. Um, we have seen, and again, this is a biased opinion because we, we live in the residential rentals. Um, we have seen that with these SFR homes, many people are comfortable with the LLCs since they already purchased them in the LLCs or they, or they buy them in the LLCs. So it has worked for us in terms of Web3 and also Web2 buyers. So if I had multiple investment properties, can they all be housed in the same LLC or do I need a separate one for each house? So I believe you need to have separate ones. Okay. Um, I, I believe you do need separate ones. Interesting. I had another question I was gonna ask you, I'm blanking on it. Um, I can't remember. That's okay. I think it was uh, having to do with, oh, cost savings. So one of the things that the blockchain is and technology does in general is it makes things more efficient, yep. more cost effective. So what's the difference sort of roughly in money that you save by using this process versus the traditional way? Yeah. So traditional real estate, you're going to be charged 6% on the sale of a home being buyer's agent, seller's agent. And that's just the start of it. Not even including like escrow fees, title attorney fees. If you need, if you're in like a state where you have to have a closing attorney and then a buyer has to have a buyer's attorney. Um, so we'll start with just an even 6%, the blockchain it's 3%. So it's drastically cuts it in half. The need for intermediaries is there's no longer a need for a buyer's agent, seller's agent, title, escrow, again, seller's agent, buyer's agent. Um, it's It just streamlines and makes everything much more efficient and cuts the cost in half. So in the long term sense, do you think this will have the impact on the realtor industry the same way the taxi industry was affected by Uber? Yeah, I do. So I've, I've had many conversations with realtors who are trying to stay ahead of the curve because they see okay. it coming. Um, it's almost the way that I look at it right now is we still are at this point of not mass adoption has occurred. So we still personally need the realtors bandwidth of buyers and we still do need them so it's almost like how do we create a scenario where we're helping them and they're helping us um i can't really speak to at what point they will be completely eliminated because real estate in itself is such a highly personal investment it's almost and, and when you're talking about owner occupied too you can throw tech at it all you want but when someone walks into a home and they fall in love with the home tech can't do that for you um so i think that there's always going to be some element of that needed and maybe that's where agents come into play um but honestly this is title companies i don't i don't uh county recorders this could be completely efficient for county recorders where some that take weeks and months to settle will now have instantaneous settlement on the blockchain so i do see some of these some of these uh positions being eliminated in the future if this does have mass adoption probably a little bit like the real estate uh, the travel agent industry that yes. you know decades ago travel agents were there was tons of them and they provide a very useful service and that kind of went away. But there's still some that help with like group trips, corporate things. So there might still be real estate agents for sort of niche type 
businesses. Yeah, well. I think that there's, I mean, it's almost like we can all play in the sandbox together. There will be a need at some point. Um, and to what capacity that is, I don't know yet. But like I said, it's a highly personal industry that you're in and you do need someone supporting you. Um, so I think that, that that will be a good thing for the agents in the industry. I'm an agent myself. I'm almost like, how do I, how do I see this for myself? Um, but again, we have a very long time until this is at the scale that we want it to. So nothing's happening anytime soon. Well, I know that many of us, as we follow the SEC Ripple case, are just waiting, chomping at the bit for some kind of clarity and resolution on securities and digital assets. But I don't know if, I don't know if the, our U.S. government is going to give us clear, transparent regulations anytime soon. I mean, the response recently was, we don't have to give you a response anytime soon, so. <laughs> right, <laughs> which is wild. so bizarre. I mean, it's just very wild. Anyone who's like worked at an employee in, as an employee in a company, like if you just decided, I'm just not gonna do that, like you would be fired. <laughs> right? exactly. exactly. So the fact that these SEC participants can just decide we're just not gonna do it and there aren't consequences just blows my mind. So. Yes, I agree, I agree. It's a crazy world right now. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you most excited about personally to see like the tokenization of assets, you know, even think a little bit bigger than real estate? Yeah, I, I I love that, like I said, at Consensus in Austin, we had very traditional people coming into the space, interested in the space, wanting to know how they can come in and how they have skin in the game. And that to me is amazing. Um, when you speak of Web3 as a community, it truly, truly is a community. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I'm, I'm excited for what, is to come out of all of this. I think we're mm -hmm. gonna see some huge shift in the future of like decentralization and just how we interact with these traditional finance or whatever the industry may be. I'm excited for that. I think it's been a much needed change. Um, and I'm also, for me personally, I think it's fun to be a woman in a highly saturated male world and kind of have a voice and be at the forefront of something really fun. So it's it's been a journey. It's been fun. And um, I'm excited to see what comes out of it. So how can people kind of keep track of you, follow you, kind of listen to the stuff that you're talking about? What's the best way yeah. to do Yeah, so um, LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. I manage our company Twitter as well. So if you see posts, those are me posting them. Um, we are pretty much at every single US, US Web3 crypto conference. So um, yeah, highly recommend Twitter. That's probably the best one and LinkedIn as well. I'll put all those links in the description for anybody watching. Awesome. Wow, Courtney, you are a wealth of knowledge with this sector, and it's exciting to see kind of innovation come to the real estate industry. As you said, it's sort of been a slower one to innovate. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you. All right. Okay.